Um, so thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm Katie Binley. I'm from the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, and I'm going to talk about how we set up automation workflows as part of uh, health protection surveillance. So first of all, what is surveillance? Um, so we deal with um, infectious diseases. We are very much information for action. So we get data um, related to testing and infections from labs and hospitals. And then we link that to epidemiological data. So that's the time, place, person. Um, and then use that to feed into testing policies and treatment regimes, ultimately to best protect the public. Um, we carry out routine monitoring of um, disease patterns to look for trends. And then we also support outbreak investigations where the goal is to identify why the outbreak occurred in the first place and suggest measures to be put in place to help end the outbreak as soon as possible. We cover a range of different topic areas, uh, such as gastrointestinal diseases, respiratory disorders like flu, RSV, and COVID, and healthcare-associated infections, among many others. So the, pan the COVID pandemic really highlighted a lot of risks with our previous workflows that we were using in surveillance. Um, we were mostly relying on Microsoft Excel and access-based databases to store our data. Um, and as, as the volume of our data started to increase, particularly during the pandemic, um, we realized using these tools, we were running the risk of either loss of data or file corruption. Um, and then a lot of our reports were generated using Excel and Word. Um, and there were a lot of manual steps associated with these tools. Um, so again, there was the risk with um, human error and also they're very time consuming. If you saw Colleen Dempster's talk yesterday, you'll have seen that some of the reports were effectively a full-time job to put together. Um, and then the other issue was that a lot of the different topic areas were using their own niche set of software tools. So it was really difficult to provide any cross-team resilience and also difficult just from a personal development perspective because it meant that everyone's skill set wasn't really transferable across the different topic areas. So once we'd identified these risks, we knew that we wanted to carry out um, significant changes to the digital architecture and surveillance. Um, so we wanted to come up with a list of um, tools that could be used to carry out the processing of data and reporting that would work across all of the topic areas. Um, we, with the introduction of newer surveillance programs like vaccines and genomics, we realized there would be, there's quite a lot of overlap, so it would be valuable to have all of the data sets all in one place so they could be easily linked. Um, and then if we could introduce these, this common set of tools that could be used by all topic areas, not only would that help to break down those silos, um, but also would allow for more consistent branding so that when you see a surveillance report, you know it's a surveillance report. So we knew what we wanted to do, so the next step was um, how we were gonna do it. Um, so we worked with an external contractor to set up an Azure cloud-based platform called the Analytics Platform. Um, that would store all of our data. Um, so the first step was to move all our data across and then move all the digital processes across. Um, and then nobody's favorite topic, but information governance was really important because um, we were handling very sensitive data. We were changing how that was being stored and processed. Um, we had to consider how we were gonna train our staff to use the new tools that were available on the analytics platform, whether we were gonna provide internal training or pay for external training. Um, and then we wanted to come up with that, what that list of software tools was going to be to allow us to ingest, process the data, um, produce static and interactive reports, and allow for more of a collaborative way of working across the team. So fast forward to today, um, we're using reproducible analytical pipelines in a lot of what we do um, with the analytics platform. Um, there are automated pipelines set up to ingest the data. Um, so those are stored in SQL databases on the cloud. So that's nice and secure. And then we use R scripts to process the data 
our markdown to create static reports. POSIT Connect to uh, automate those reports so they come into our email inboxes when we want them to. Power BI to create interactive dashboards. Um, here, these are some screenshots of some of the public facing reports that we have on the PHA website. Most of these are created either using R and R Markdown. Um, POSIT Connect is handy for um, automating the uh, production of a lot of these, but it's also useful for internal reports so we can keep an eye on the patterns in, in the diseases before they go into the public reports and also allows us to keep an eye on the pipelines themselves, so for quality assurance and data validation. Um, working on the analytics platform gives us access to more data science tools that we wouldn't have had available to us before. So using DevOps um, repositories and, and Git, um, we're able to collaborate and um, across the, the teams um, carry out regular code review, which means that we're, it's a safer way of working because we can be sure that um, the logic is constantly getting reviewed. Um, and then the version control is really nice because it means we can roll back to a previous version of the code if, if needed. And then this move to the analytics platform was a huge piece of work and is still ongoing. Um, so we needed a project management tool, which is where JIRA comes in. So this helps us to visually map out um, where we're at in terms of progress of all the, the different tasks. Um, and it's quite nice because it gives a better visibility across the team so everyone can see how their piece of work fits into the bigger picture and just allows a more agile way of working. Um, so we're looking forward, to, we've, we've got some of our data sets in our platform, but it has been a slightly slower process than we'd hoped. So we're gonna continue to move more um, data sources in there and the processes associated with that. Um, and then we're hoping as we automate more uh, of these steps, it will give us time to maybe look into more exciting work like modeling, phylogenetics. Um, and then finally, I just wanna finish with some kind of key points that we've identified as part of our automation journey. Um, so I think prioritizing, because um, you can't move everything all over at once. So starting off with the, either the high risk or the quick wins. And I think that helps you to very quickly get your team on board they can see the, the benefits of automation and then you can start to build that enthusiasm and gain some momentum. Um, really think about what that final list of software tools that you're gonna use so that you can future-proof it and um, work out what, um, whether you need to think about costings of training or licenses, um, even things like local IT support. Documentation is really important. Um, having data dictionaries so that your team know what data is stored in which table, um, templates, user guides, just the simple things so that you're not having to duplicate effort each time. Um, and then just wanna end on a final note about having patience with your team because this is a huge overhaul in how they're working, not only learning new tools, but also just conceptually the idea of virtual machines and agile working. Um, it's a big shift, it takes a long time to kind of get your head around. So I think having the support there for your staff is really important. That's it, thank you. Thank you for your wonderfully insightful presentation. <laughs> I, was, I was probably paying more attention to that than actually the, the, uh, the timing, it was just brilliant. So thank, thank you ever so much. Um, we're now gonna open uh, for the room for just a five minute Q&A session. Um, so Bianca's now going to be my, my, my little assistant and if there's any questions in the room, please, uh, please do pop your hand up and we'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hazel Kirkland from Not Nottinghamshire Healthcare. Um, that sounds like an amazingly complex piece of work. So it's just a really basic question, but how long did it take? So we started the journey um, probably towards the end of 2020. Um, I think just setting up the cloud-based platform probably took the best part of six months. And then it's been very much a work in progress since then um, as new lab systems are brought in that kind of introduces new problems that we then have to fix. So it's kind of, yeah, it's several years, definitely. Uh, 
Hey, uh, yeah, awesome. Really great to see you doing lots of really cool rap stuff. Um, I wondered, because you use Azure DevOps, are you managing to, and how are you, like publishing your code publicly? Like, are, are, are you doing that, or we're do you have a plan to do that? Yeah, we're not at the moment. It's definitely something that we've got the appetite for, but I think it's just, um, again, it comes down to the local IT support. We are quite restricted um, for some things, but I like I would like to see us doing that. Um, there's no reason why we we shouldn't, and it'll definitely help with with collaboration. So. Yeah, uh, and uh, I guess NHS England on our rap website, I've got a bunch of, gui I guess, guidance about how we sign off code so it's safe mm -hmm. to share with how you check it to make sure it's not going to be bad stuff in it. That might be helpful. Yeah, but like, definitely, uh, yeah. I'll just talk about that more. But thank you. Thank awesome. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katie.